Well, I think we're, we're good to start. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hector Garcia. I'm chair at ASNU Tech and secretary at ASTM or Tech. Uh, we want to welcome you to this talk, Additive Manufacturing, Background, Fundamentals, and Standardization, which is part of the series of additive manufacturing talks that ASME and ASTM or Tech organize. Uh, we want to thank you for your interest and willingness to participate in this event. Uh, for a much more fluid event, please keep your microphones off. If you have any questions, you can ask them through the public chat or send them privately to me or to Christian or to Sebastian or any co-host that is in the, in the room. Uh, the questions will be answered at the end, but also there will be short times during the presentation for questions. Uh, also, at the end, a uh, satisfaction form will be sent. Uh, this will serve for uh, or to cor corroborate the attendance for those who ask for a certificate and for those who want to request a new certificate. Uh, and now, to begin with the presentation, I want to introduce our speaker today. He is a PhD, Klaus Vovia. Uh, Klaus Vovia works as a senior researcher in additive manufacturing technology at Sintef Manufacturing AS in Trondheim, Norway. He started working with AM for metallic materials in 1997 and defended his PhD thesis on the topic in 2004. Work has covered multiple research projects in various aspects of this technology, from new processes development to practical solutions for industrial applications with stable state-of-the-art technology. Class has been a member of ASTM F42 committee from the start in 2009 and presently serves as chair for subcommittee F4291 terminology and has also served as a member of ASTM International's board of directors for the period uh, 2019 from to 2021. He participated in the inauguration for ISO TC261 in 2011, and since then has served as convener for work group one for terminology, as well as the ISO ASTM joint group uh, 51 for terminology. Furthermore, Plus served as chairman for the Swedish National Standardization Committee for Additive Manufacturing for nine years, and is an appointed expert to, to the European AM Standardization Committee, CEN TC438. And now, uh, with no further to say, uh, I want to introduce you to our speaker today, Klaus Weber. Klaus? You are muted, Klaus. Yes, yes, now I'm not. Thank you, Hector, and thank you for making this introduction in English because I probably would not have understood Spanish at all. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to start to share the screen, if it's okay with you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that should... Yeah, this is the one. Uh, okay, um, uh, my speak today would cover some of the basics and fundamentals for additive manufacturing, a little bit about, stand, uh, about standardization and industrialization, and our effort to make sure that this technology uh, grows and develops uh, as, an, as an industrial manufacturing uh, process. There, I sense you've made such a good presentation. I can drop this with slide. Uh, as uh, Hector mentioned, I work for Synthef Manufacturing in Trondheim. And Trondheim is in Norway, which is, if you didn't know, located in the northern Europe, uh, which means that we are in summer right now and you're in the winter. Uh, this northern location makes sure that we don't really get it dark. This picture was taken about two o'clock in the morning uh, and uh, at this time of year. And uh, this is what looks about when you have it in the winter at noon. You see the shadows are very long, so we don't get much. Uh, it's uh, maybe about four hours of daylight. On the other hand, the summer doesn't get dark at all. So it's a bit different. Uh, getting back to look at the conditions for additive manufacturing, 
you need, to, in my opinion, you need to look very much in the whole perspective and background for making and shaping objects. And thinking of it, the functionality of any man-made object is usually, it's always derived, it depends on the combination of the object geometry and the properties in the material that is made from. And therefore, to have achieved this, the manufacturing processes for the objects set up of a series of operations and sub-processes to give this geometry with intolerances to a material capable of possessing the desired properties. Does this make sense to you? Okay. Anybody doubt? No, apparently not. Do you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good. It's so quiet. I'm not used to this. Um, okay, thanks for this. Okay, right. And looking, going into it, there is only three principal methods for shaping materials. You have subtractive shaping. There is a, you have a raw material, you have a raw block of raw material, a workpiece, and you remove uh, pieces, chips and grains and, uh, and dust from it, like such as uh, machining, grinding, drilling, uh, EDM, electric discharge machining, laser cutting, laser ablation. The point with, if you have subtractive shaping, the only thing that is actually affected by this process is the direct surface that is exposed to the, to the tool that's used to shape the material. It does not affect the material in itself. Then you have the formative shaping, where the raw material is shaped by the application of pressure to the material, such as forging, pressing, bending, casting, etc injection molding and when it's uh, and then a material is shaped by uh, formatting processes it does have is it is affected by uh, in type of deformation of the object and that is means the material has been impacted or affected by it or if it's you talk about casting that would be a recrystallization process during the solidification process so that means that the material actually is a bit affected by the shaping principle. Then we have additive shaping. And that's simply uh, shaping by sub successive addition of material, such as different coating and deposition methods, but also, of course, additive manufacturing technologies. And in additive manufacturing technologies or these shaping and coating, the material is being formed, shaped by the joining of the material which means that it is much more affected by the manufacturing process than any of the others. So if you take a step back and look through history and nature, is shaping objects back to this addition of material, is this really new technology? Uh, not quite. Uh, before people have, have invented the pottery wheel, uh, they actually used some coils of clay and just put them on top of each other and thumbed them together. Uh, this picture is, is an illustration from a book about uh, Native Americans in Southwestern United States. I don't really know if this used the same type, of, same type of process in Peru, uh, or if the pottery was invented there. But it's certainly, uh, uh, but it's certainly something that was used uh, in Europe, uh, North America, and also in Asia before the pottery wheel was invented. But men were not first. We know that birds build the nests, some bird species build the nest by successive addition of small lumps of clay. There's a couple of swallows here. Uh, but the birds are not, maybe not that advanced because the wasps, hornets, they make the nest by taking wood and chew it into a pulp, pulpy paper, and form the nests. And they, they seem communal nests and they're quite complex shaped but it's still successive addition of material piece by piece. The most advanced use of uh, uh, additive shaping principles are the mollusks, to my knowledge, where uh, small crystals of calcium carbonate is being joined together 
simply by gluing them with, by a protein that's uh, formed by the by the animal itself, which means that the, the composite, this composite material you have in the seashell or a snail shell, is actually many times stronger than the pure calcium carbonate. So they are, they even do this with advanced nanotechnology, which we still cannot quite duplicate. But they've been doing it for about 300 million years. So give us some time, we may catch up with them. The first modern additive manufacturing system uh, stereolithography was patented in 1986. The first machine sold in 1987. So the technology may be fairly new, but the principle as such is just natural and really, really ancient. Modern additive manufacturing actually came out of developments of 3D CAD systems during the 1970s and 80s. Uh, during the 1980s, there were some great challenges for the U United, United American automotive industry. And they were, there were some competitive from Japan and the, they found that the Japanese automakers were much faster in developing new models. And one advantage, one bottleneck for the uh, Americans was this was too long time to develop prototypes, too long time to high cost to develop prototypes and they need lots of prototypes. So that meant that there was a great need for uh, augmented rapid uh, prototyping processes. And that led to there was money in, to be invest in this development. And a number of these processes were developed during the 1980s and early 90s. And they have, for example, uh, stereolithography developed by uh, Charles Hull in 1986, pattern in 1986, selective sintering, uh, trademarked as uh, SLS, selective laser sintering by Deckard in patented in 89. Apparatus, a method for, three for creating three dimensional objects, which eventually was trademarked as few step position modeling by Scott, uh, Scott Crump in 1992. Uh, techniques for three dimensional printing uh, by Emmanuel Sachs, Michael Seema, and another and a group of all uh, from uh, MIT in 1990, patented in 1993. There were laminated object manufacturing, LOM by Fagan and Son, patented in 1996, and something called casting shapes, and with lots of other names too, which was very much based on different types of welding, uh, patented by Arcel and Lessman in 1989. The earliest applications in additive manufacturing, great success was rapid prototyping. It was so popular and so established that people started to call this technology RP technology, rapid prototyping technology, regardless what it was used for. We had a several systems that were uh, launched, um, launched and put into use through the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and this has also impacted the way people build their preconcepted understanding for this technology. Uh, that it's that it's the that I, in the form of rapid prototyping process, which has had the effect that still today, some people think that additive manufacturing includes a lot more than you would normally have in a, uh, a based on the actual technology, which is additive manufacturing. This is something I will touch later on in this, in this uh, presentation. Then people said that if you can save time and money by rapid prototyping, why not make tools? Because tools takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money too. In particular, the quick to the tooling to make the first uh, functional prototypes, which has, should have the same material properties as the final part, and also the ones that you need to get your product into market first. That could be so-called soft tooling, bridge tooling. There were a number of these pro projects, uh, processes that were uh, launched and patented in the 1990s and uh, to the early 2000s. They're usually based on you try to use what was known as what was then conventional rapid prototyping technology and then convert these prototypes into tools. So some sort of like called Keltum Viba tools and then something called DMLS. Uh, which was launched by EOS. And then with rapid manufacturing, we said, okay, why don't we make final parts directly by rapid prototyping, we call it rapid manufacturing. 
uh, it got some applications on special cases, uh, but it really did not take off on the industrial scale for some basically some niches. Uh, what you see down right down in the lower right there is actually my dive computer. I just bought it on the on the internet, and when I got it home, I realized that the the shell was made obviously made by additive manufacturing, and I dare say that it was made in an EOS probably EOS machine machine from EOS in Germany, uh, probably one called P three nine five. And it was most likely polyamide PA12 powder, but that's only because I'm a professional nerd. The thing with AEM is that it's very different from other uh, technologies. The operation by successive addition of materials means that you actually build the material through the shape of the product. It, and this in turn means that the properties will depend on the process conditions and also on the orientation of the building direction. And if you look at, for example, in conventional machining like uh, CNC milling, grinding and stuff, uh, successive removal of material costs time and money. The more material you remove, the higher cost. Uh, with additive manufacturing is just about the same, but on the contrary, uh, success additional material costs time and money. So the more material you add, the higher, the, the longer the time to build it and the higher the costs, which means that it's, an, uh, it's advantageous for you if you can add as little material as possible with additive manufacturing. So you may, you, it will be to your advantage to make, to make uh, products light and not use more than, being, than absolutely necessary. This also means uh, successive additional material means that you can have individual variation at almost no additional cost. It doesn't cost so much more. You need, of course, to design the individual variation, but otherwise uh, the cost is, uh, it doesn't really change. The cost is how much material you add. That's basically the main cost and that's the processing time. You can make much more complex geometries and this means also that can reduce the number of components and operations because, well, you can uh, you can just put the material where you need it, and you don't need that many tools. You don't need uh, to separate it in a way that it can, that the tool can reach in the formation or removing of a mold. You just place the material where you need it, and that enables also more intelligent designs and improved functionalities. Uh, it minimizes material consumption. And since the material is joined together, and you actually it's possible to you had, can influence and to some extent change the material, the control how it's being joined together. It really a game change for materials technology. It's possible to do a lot more within an AM process and uh, auxiliary process on round than you can do with conventional manufacturing. If you think about it, uh, complexity, uh, additive manufacturing makes complexity very easy. This is an example for, uh, for actually a rather simple structure. But if you make it by conventional injection molding, it means that you will have lots of parts. Uh, and you need to something to, you, you need some, an operation to assemble it and join it together, build it together. And all these parts, if you made them by, for example, by injection molding, you would need tools for all of them. And that's a lot of tools. Uh, with additive manufacturing, you just make the component in one piece. And uh, you can store the design and the instruction how to make it in, as a digital file, instead of store all these tools uh, in some kind of a warehouse somewhere until you need it again. This is a great advantage. So if you're looking into how you're going to use AM, you need to think about uh, what is the right uh, solution and then what is the right problem you need to console by AM. Many times I've been saying that additive manufacturing is a fantastic solution to the problem you didn't know you had. Uh, and that's also a bit of a challenge. So first of all, you need to figure out what should be made by AM and why you should make it by AM. Then you should start to think about how can it, how should it be made by AM? 
So you need to take the things, uh, address the problems in several steps and in the right principles. And if you think, uh, uh, and you need also need to base everything on whatever the market can use, what's good for industry, what are the technologies out there, what kind of products and what needs are there, industrial needs, and uh, if there are market to pay for it. But if you use to combine available AM technology with existing product needs and uh, find a solution, how you can, how you can make it, then it, that will need to improve in the technology. And uh, as the technology is getting improved, you will find a need and how to develop new technology. And eventually this will be available as slight improvements and eventually this will go to the market. So this is an endless loop of innovation, but it also means there's a great uh, potential, it's a source for potential innovations that is almost, I can't imagine the end of that. It will continue for a very long time. For example, a very successful application, one of the ones that have the greatest impact, or at least one of the first to have a great impact, was shells for hearing aids. You know, the, the little customized part that goes into the ear. Ears are individual, people are individual. There is no mass, uh, no, no ear is exactly like the, looked like the other. So uh, what, uh, people did previously before AM, they took some wax and pushed into the air and then made an made an uh, sort of an imprint of the of the geometry, and then they used this imprint to form a mold and then cast the individual uh, shell. The problem with this is that every time you need a new one. You need to make a new one. You need to go through the whole process of checking out and making the imprint of the individual's ears. And it's a lot more labor intensive for the skilled technician. Uh, for example, when my, uh, my late dad used to have hearing, hearing aids, uh, once upon a time, it was broken. The shell was broken. So it hurt when he put it in and asked if he could get a new one. But then the dog, at that time, they did not use AM-based production of these uh, shells. So uh, the, the medical, uh, medical clinic said, well, we need first to set a date so we, can come, so we can come in and talk to the technician who will see how it's broken. And then the technician will make a case of it and take it up to a meeting. And then we will discuss and find if you actually really need a new shell. And if we decide that you need an untitled to new shell, you can come back and we'll make an imprint of your ear. And after that, it's about six weeks until you could have your new shell. This will mean that it, it would take uh, almost three months to get a new shell. If they would have used AM, AM based, they would have made this imprint of the once and then scan the surface and have a three dimensional model, digital model of the surface of the, shell, of the shell that goes in. And immediately, if it broke, they could just put that shell, put that uh, mod, uh, that file into the, the next build order and have it built in a few hours. And then it could, could come up and just shift electronics. That would save them a lot of money and a lot of time uh, for both the technicians, but also for the doctors and all the administrators and everybody in the valuation process. And of course, for the customer, it will be much easier. So this has been a great success. It's used widely. Uh, I'll get back to that later. Then talk about this uh, braces for, uh, for regulation of dental positions, the braces. Uh, when I was a kid, many kids in my class uh, got these little steel braces that was glued in and they walked around with a lot of metal in their mouth and a lot of difficulties to clean it. And it didn't look nice. And for young kids, it's something that they don't like to look like. Uh, nowadays, people make a scanning uh, of the existing teeth and then they turn that into a computer model, make a mold, and uh, by AM and then make a transparent uh, brace 
which they can have in about, uh, which the patient, the customer can have in about a couple of weeks and then they make one which has been manipulated. So there will be a pushing of the teeth until they actually reach the final uh, desired position. And also, this also means uh, that you can take the brace out when you don't want it in the mouth. You can put it on when you, and it's basically invisible when you have it there. So it's much more convenient, much safer, and much easier to clean the teeth. Uh, there are uh, several billions of these braces that have been produced and are used, as far as I know, in large parts of the world. But not only the position of live teeth, there's also when sometimes you need implants, crowns and bridges. Uh, this act, these numbers are from 2016. And in those days, uh, EUS, a German company, uh, could say that they knew there were 60 systems installed to produce 6.8 million units of dental crowns uh, and bridges implants uh, made in cobalt chromium. And it's a simple business model because uh, one, uh, each of these machines can make up to 450 units per day. And the technician who runs it can build all these all together instead of making all these models by hand and then trying to make molds and cast it. So it's cheaper in that way. You don't need to put as much labor. Uh, it's faster and you get a very, very accurate, digi accurate uh, uh, form. And there's no need for machine supervision. Uh, it would be possible for a technician to service several machines that's uh, reduced manual operations. It's just loading and unloading the machine. And uh, just by happy coincidence, the surface you get out from this process is actually a superior adhesion to the veneer, ceramic veneers. You can get a right, so the, uh, so it's uh, the, the color uh, fits much better, color and size fits much better than normal uh, dental implants. Another area was also quite early for use additive manufacturing was uh, uh, implants, uh, surgical implants for craniomaxiofacial surgery, uh, difficult to pronounce anyway. For example, if someone had cancer, had an accident, war veterans, or just cases of bone degradation. For example, the model there in the, of the model of the red skull in the middle is an example from a young lady in Italy, in Italy who had been in a car accident, I think. And the pieces of her skull had to be removed and they would not grow back on. Uh, you need something to protect the brain, of course. So what they did do in this case, uh, they simply made a scanning of the cranium and then uh, on the cranium's other side of the whole cranium, but then took from the other side and mirrored it to give the right turn of it and used that to design a, an implant of titanium, uh, which was uh, later put in and worked perfectly well. As far as I know, the only thing this young lady, probably this young lady has ever is when she tries to fly because of course the metal detector entering in an airplane does make a noise, does report it. Uh, on the right-hand side, there is another case. It was actually the same surgeon who did the skull implant. And this is a case where there is a, uh, a jawbone. It was an old lady uh, in her 90s. I think she lived in, the, in Belgium or the Netherlands. She had some kind of wound on her chin and it wouldn't heal. So she came in and asked for it and as the doctor checked it out, they realized there was a bad case of bone degradation. The bone has started to simply degrade and it would keep on doing so unless it was removed. So it was absolutely necessary to degrade. The problem is, well, for a young person, this is not a problem. It happens to young people too, but then you can form a, 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 a construction and then take some of the natural bone and it will grow into it and get the shape back and grow it together. But for an old person in this age, they cannot get that. That will not be regrowing. So they need, it was necessary to remove this, uh, her jawbone, uh, but they couldn't grow a new one. 
So, but now since the surgeon is an experienced man and had been working with this skull case, he contacted the same AM companies who were behind, who had helped him before, and they decided to make a solution. So they, before they removed the original jawbone, they made a CT scan of it and converted it into a digital model and redesigned it a little bit. So it's a hollowed structure of titanium. Uh, they rebuilt it, made sure there were some uh, holes they can assemble new dentures inside and there would be room to keep the nerves. Uh, the surgery uh, took about six hours, four hours to remove the old uh, jawbone and, and to protect her nerves so that she could speak, talk uh, afterwards. And also uh, then just two hours to put in the new one everything in position. And the next morning when the surgery made, the surgery made his round, she found this old lady. She was just sitting in her bed and chat with the nurses. She was fine. Uh, a few months later, she returned and they uh, assembled new teeth for her. And as far as we know, she lived uh, quite well ever after. And it's a much better situation than the alternative, which would have been that she would be living without a jawbone. That means she would never be able to speak or eat by herself again. So this was a very successful case and showing a little bit about the, uh, how useful additive manufacturing can be and what benefits it can bring to individual people. One thing that has actually had reached a very wide uh, industrial level of production is hip implants, hip joints, orthopedical hip joints, the little cup that goes into the hip bone. Uh, thanks to additive manufacturing successive addition, you can design even trabecular structures that can have designed them to that you have this sort of a three dimensional mesh structure to which enables and allows the bone to grow into it, into the structure and have a much better connection to the implant. Uh, and that means that you need to design the pore geometry, the size and relative density and roughness. And this has been so successful that at least as far as I know in Europe, this is the predominant method of producing these. They produce uh, more than 100,000 every year. And it's, it's simply standard today. And there is, a, there is CE certification in Europe, FDA in the US and equivalent uh, uh, certification from China and other parts of the world. So uh, this is very, th th this is, this is just the way you do it. This is state of the art now. Now, a quite a funny case uh, was a uh, was Autophone, which is a Danish company that makes high end pickups for vinyl records. Uh, they participated there in a project uh, with some with researchers I know, and they needed to have these pickups made in steel because they needed to have the correct Young's model is on it to get the right, uh, the right uh, uh, properties. But they wanted to make them a bit lighter. Uh, so, the, so, so this uh, project to try to redesign them and change it so they would not be as dense as it would be if you had cast them. It turns out they didn't go so well by changing the weight, but it did change the acoustical properties in the material by changing the process parameters. So it became has extremely good ones. Uh, and it was a bit of a disappointment. First, the Danish researcher who was working on very disappointed because he failed to make it lighter. But when the company listened to him and said, oh, this is fantastic, it's a dream, it's exactly what we wanted. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, and the researchers could just agree that that was exactly what you tried to achieve. Uh, but it means that they have a much more uh, improved design freedom. You get a much shorter time for production. If you, may, if you design it and make your prototypes with additive manufacturing, then you just can decide that now we make production and you produce it in the same machine. So you go from having four to six months of uh, production time to a few weeks. And it means that you can make the acoustic properties uh, adapted to uh, and optimized for for the type for your design and the type of uh, music and sound you want to reproduce. 
a British company named Craft Filters decided to make go into making custom filters and found AM to be the optimal uh, tool for them. Uh, it means they can customize uh, the fit and flowability. They can graduate the metal thickness and give the strength where it's needed and nowhere else. Uh, they can also make sure that it's uh, that that they can have whatever complex shape, whatever feed that actually need, and can make it customized for each occasion. Uh, but a possibility of making complex shapes is also very good. For example, if you want to get into making uh, injection molding tools, build in conformal cooling channels, meaning cooling channels that follows exactly the shape of the cavity of the product, you get a cooling where you need it, at the needed, uh, where you need it. And uh, it has been very successful. It's, uh, I would argue that it is state of the art in large parts of the world. There's numerous uses. There's one very famous, I think it's the Lego Corporation. I, they make these Lego toy blocks. I suppose, it, I, I played with them. I guess that some of you may have done too. Uh, when they started to look into this, they realized they could reduce the uh, great reduction cycle times, about 30% shorter cycle times. They also have reported 30% better quality and 30% uh, prolonged life cycles for the tool in search uh, as they use it. So uh, it's, it's a great advantage. Uh, depends a little bit, of course, what the materials you are injection molding and how you design it. So there can be some variability of the benefits, but it's uh, the benefits are still there and they're very significant. Uh, actually for machining, subtractive manufacturing, uh, Sandvik, Swedish company has been working on this. And one of the first products they came up with was topology optimized cutter head for a milling cutter. They put in uh, integrated uh, cutting fluid channels within this within the tool. So the cutting fluid comes where it actually is needed. So you don't have to drench the whole part with it. And since they can make this cutter head much lighter, it means that the re vibrations will reduce be reduced a lot, in particular, if you need to reach at a long distance. Uh, and it means they can cut much deeper, you can a higher, uh, uh, higher cutting speed and altogether they guarantee up to 200% decreased productivity. Uh, for uh, example, the aerospace industry, uh, Boeing was very early. I am not can't guarantee that these pictures are from Boeing, but it's the show the same type of uh, product. Uh, it's simply uh, air ducts for ventilation in, in commercial airplanes. Uh, as you see, these ones, if they would have been injection molded, it would be quite complex tools. They would probably need it to be made in more parts. Uh, but if you make them by AM, you don't need to have this great number of uh, entries in a catalog. The product and tool catalogs can be reduced so much. They also don't need to have much uh, large inventories or spare parts and inventories of tools. If you're talking, for example, the aerospace industry, then there's not necessarily that huge. You don't make millions of planes usually. Uh, so uh, you save a lot. They don't need to have us uh, make expensive tools to make just a limited number of planes and then keep them for long, keep the tools for a long time. And uh, just cutting on this level of administration uh, for the product and tool catalogs, uh, the inventories of spare parts, it saves them really, really lots of money. Uh, another thing with additive manufacturing is that since you don't need to add any more material than you actually do need for the functionality of your product, means they make things can make it lighter. And then you talk about in air transport, saving weight saves a lot of money and it comes to uh, comes to fuel. This is, uh, these numbers are actually a few years old. So it was when fuel was a lot cheaper, 
but still, one kilo of redu reduced weight saves you about 3,000 US dollars per year in fuel. And if you take a plane as a lifespan uh, of about 30 years, that means you $90,000 are saved if you can save a kilo. And uh, you can easily, for a huge plane, a huge commercial plane, traffic plane, uh, reduce the weight by 150 kilos. It's just taking a thousand components and make them 150 grams lighter. That would save 13.5 million dollars in fuel over those 30 years. That would be that would save a lot of money in the fuels for that plane. And if you think about the number of planes that they estimate it would be ordered in the next 20 years, that would could lead up to $351 billion of saved fuel and not to mention the CO2 that would not have to be uh, spread. So it's this is a very clear for many reasons, great motivation for the aerospace industry to save money and weight by additive manufacturing. For example, we have this case. This was a very early case uh, that came into uh, Airbus uh, 350 XWB. Uh, just the topology optimization of brackets, reduced weights. Uh, it was first thought that you should use the piece of an aluminum and mill it. Uh, but instead, they decided to make it in titanium and make it hollow. Now you say titanium is much more expensive than aluminum, and that's true. But that's if you think in level of blocks. It's true, also true, that uh, the powder is a bit more expensive, but then the price difference isn't that great. And the real cost for manufacturing these parts is not the material cost, but it's the uh, manufacturing process cost, uh, the, the, long, the, the, the time, the machine cost us for the time it's, it's, uh, it's working, it's building. In this case, they managed to save the weight between 30 to 55%. Uh, at least more than 30% than the aluminum parts, and it's hollow. And it's also 90% reduction in material used. Uh, so it actually is, uh, since you can say this can be converted into saved fuel, it means that you can save money on using this part. Another application which is quite successful and quite famous, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen, heard about this, is reducing the number of components and weight and improving the performance in GE Aviation's LEAP engine uh, fuel nozzle. Uh, it's norm, it's original, it's 20 components in, uh, in the fuel injection nozzle, but it's reduced to one component. Uh, it's actually about 25% lighter. And you have, since you have no, this not, don't have the same limitations when it comes to design, you can reduce the coking and thereby increase the life lifespan of this product for uh, about five times. Uh, they 15, 2015 and 16, they ramped up production. They expected the annual production be around 35 to 40,000 pieces. And this is industrial manufacturing in airspace, in airspace. Or this is the way GE says it, start with one part, they need to do 35 to 40,000 per year. 20 parts is one, 25% weight production, five times more durable. Uh, they used it also for, uh, GE used AM also for just a uh, test for turboprop engine. Uh, this combustion schedule could be reduced from 12 to six months, so it was much faster. They didn't need any cost structural castings. They saved 5% of the weights. 20% uh, lower fuel burn. And it was one 855 parts reduced into 12 parts. So it's a, it's a lot of savings there. Another thing, uh, if you look into materials, uh, there are materials which are very difficult to process in conventional methods, such as tattoo and aluminide. It's very light. It's actually quite stiff at high temperatures. The only comparison material uh, for high temperature and stiffness is titanium uh, alloys. Uh, so it would be perfect to low pressure turbine blades. But the problem is that uh, they're terrible for machining. Uh, you can grind them a bit, but they can also 
be quite brittle if you do it wrong. Uh, if you can cast them, you still need uh, to do a lot of grinding. And there's also about 40% losses of those casted parts because it may crack during the solidification project, uh, process. Uh, instead, uh, there was a company uh, that's called Avio, later born by uh, GE Aviation, that investigated doing them by AM using an, an electro beam melting process uh, in a titanium aluminide. Uh, it has been uh, successfully built in and applied to the uh, GE9X engine, jet engine. Uh, they can make the material much lighter and thinner because they do it by AM, compared to cast about 40% uh, reduction in weight compared to casting. There's a lot of reduction in machining because you, get, you can build it closer to the final geometry. So they invested, built a new plant for production of these uh, turbine blades built in 2013. Uh, they have over 60 AM machines just building them. They have a gas atomization unit to make the powder. And of course, the first plane with this engine made its first flight in, in uh, 2020. So this is real stuff. Another application, uh, repair, extended part lifetime. Pratt & Whitney has been repairing war sealing tips for an oil air seal in a turbine uh, for a jet engine. It, said it has been certified for repair in critical part aerospace applications. They do it. Uh, in 2016, they have made over 1,200 parts repaired. It's allowed to uh, repair for four cycles, meaning that the life for this seal is extended from 10,000 to 50,000 hours. And uh, as far as I know, as long as that engine is being used, they will keep on doing these repairs. So they're probably a lot more by now. Uh, Siemens turbo machinery uh, has a, had a problem with the gas uh, burner tips. They're made in Hasteloy X. It's a, 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 a gas turbine for energy generation. It's a little bit like a jet engine that stands on the ground. So there's very high temperatures uh, and it's a very high cases of uh, wear inside because the temperature and high turbulence. And eventually the burner tape is being worn down. Uh, normal conventional repair means you have to cut it off and machine a new one and weld it back on. Altogether 18 welds. Lead time for this type of repair would typically be 44 weeks. Uh, and this costs, of course, costs money and it's very, very, uh, it's hard to work, hard, difficult work. So why don't just mill it down and build on with AM? And they worked with a company, a US, a German AM machine building company to develop this solution. And uh, they adapted the machines and they can now, they, they did mill it down and then rebuild it by AM. And then the lead time is just four weeks, a so reduction from 44 to four weeks in cycle times. And uh, this was enough for Siemens to make a, to make a great investments. They built a, uh, built a plant, a spe specific factory, invested 20 million in that for a new plant in production. And they make much more parts. Nowadays, they make the entire tip by AM in you. And they also can enable to uh, make a different, more optimized design in the part. This is what a new factory looks like. Uh, actually, uh, I've been there and checked it out, so it's true. Uh, and in other parts of the energy sector, uh, there's a Norwegian oil and energy company, have a lot of offshore oil uh, installation. There's a Norwegian company called Equinor. Uh, the problem, they, one of the problems they have is that it's corrosion of all their gear, in particular those that are out on sea, lots of salty air there. And uh, that means a lot of wear, a lot of wearing down and eventual failure. And of course, changing stuff in a producing oil platform is enormous, expensive and difficult. So instead they looked into if they could uh, do repair on site and they have developed this uh, welding robot uh, to do this in additive, formal additive manufacturing. 
basically, there is a 3D scanning of the of the uh, corroded area. And, co and then they compare it to the original uh, expected size and use this to uh, generate a path for the, this, the position of new material over it. Uh, the deposition path is automatically converted into program and a sequence control for the motion of the robot. It works uh, as far as they've been told so far. It has, has only been working for a few years now, but it works perfectly fine and they use it while these corroded uh, constructions structures are still in are still in use, which is of course a great advantage. Another thing, <laughs> spare parts. Uh, after a while, spare parts are not are no longer produced; they become obsolete, and that can be very very expensive. Also, the case from Equinor, the locking screws for the switch cabinets in their offshore installations. Switch cabinets, offshore installation, you cannot let it be open. It must be locked. You don't want corrosion in a switch cabinet. Uh, but then the spare parts for the locking mechanism are obsolete and not, no longer available. Uh, supplier says, oh, hey, you have to change the entire cabinet. But that means that they would uh, actually need to rewire every installation uh, that goes through that switch cabinet and set up a parallel system to have to be able to have these uh, offshore oil platform uh, production in production uh, during this change. This is enormously time consuming and uh, very, very expensive. And there's also significant risk in it. So as an alternative, uh, Equinor looked into if they could reverse engineer the, uh, the obsolete parts and that wasn't a problem. They could easily build it uh, by AM screws in polyamide using a powder bit diffusion process. And uh, this solution, they estimated this solution will save them $10 million every year for making this little small plastic stuff and put in their location instead of changing the cabinets. In other case, uh, you can not only save money, you also save environmental impact also from Equinor, it's a fan for electric motor unit. Uh, spare parts, no more uh, spare parts for that fan available. And it was damaged. The uh, supplier said you have to change the entire uh, electric motor unit. That also costs time, it costs money, and then you cannot use it during the time. So they investigated reverse engineering of the broken fan and then figured out how, to, uh, what, how it needs to be repaired to make a new file for it and built the new part by AM, they produced it. And uh, well, the carbon dioxide impact of replacing the motor unit would be 4,600 kilos, but the carbon dioxide impact of change of making the AM spare part would be just 3.8 kilos. And of course it would save them a lot of money. Actually, Equinor, after these cases, there are a lot more of them, they have estimated that they will be saving 50 million US dollars this year by, through the use of AM parts, the AM spare parts and repair. So uh, they are quite keen for this technology. If you think about the impact uh, of a, finding a good AM application, that can be quite disruptive and significant. This uh, chart goes for hearing aids on the world market. If you take a look, for example, at in 2005, they actually been doing hearing aids shells uh, for with AM for quite some time. Uh, it was around in 2003, about 19%, 2004, 18%, 18%. But 2008, you see an explosion between 2005 and the three years from 2005 to 2008, there's more or less an explosion, then it's just about 99%. Uh, they say that the, United, that the American, the US uh, hearing aid industry, those companies who didn't manage to make the change from conventional manufacturing to AM-based manufacturing in 500 days had to leave the business. They're not around anymore because they could not compete anymore. Nobody would buy from them. So it's, this is something that's quite worth considering. Now, uh, one of these breaks, uh, are there any specific questions at this time?
did you hear me? Yes, I can see any specific questions in the chat right now. People uh, are in shock, either in shock or have fallen asleep. <laughs> oh, we have we have one in the private chat. I I think yeah, it says uh, due to the great amount of new technologies coming out of our AM, in what part of the innovation triangle shown in a previous slide does the standardization of AM processes begin to develop? All of them. It's involved in all of them. But I will get into standardization further on and also explain that standardization has to be based on the willingness of people to participate. Standards are always based, are always voluntary. So people need to, uh, companies and people need to be willing to put in their time and money to participate in developing standards. So the true topics for standardization will always be those topics that the industry is demanding and requesting. But I will get into standardization later. Uh, I see that I have been uh, actually running quite later and I have so many more slides. So maybe we should get on going again here. Yeah, I, I, hope have, you're not I have one more question. Sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, it, it says uh, regarding design for AM, are there AM techniques that require more consideration than others and which technique is the hardest and which one give better results? <laughs> get better results, that's, it depends. All of this, it depends. You have to learn to design for them. And you need to find uh, the, the, the AM process you should use depends on what you want to do. And then how you design for it depends which process you use and what you intend to do. You simply have to learn it. All right. So it's so 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 it's a, a, a it's a challenging question indeed. Yeah, I have no more questions regarding. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, so far, so yeah. We yeah. Can I I see. I need to speed up a lot here, a lot. Uh, but I'll try to do, and and and, and if I don't manage to uh, finish this uh, within the next expected half hour. Uh, I'm willing to continue after that if you have time, or otherwise I try to make sure to make these slides uh, into a PDF files, which you can share afterwards. Okay? Okay, it's all right. Okay. Uh, additive manufacturing started, up, started out very much as rapid prototyping technologies, but moving from rapid prototyping to industrial manufacturing is quite a different thing. You need to think differently. Additive manufacturing is not one single process or any, or just not the, actually not even a single technology. There are many different processes around them. And if you look for, from a rapid prototyping perspective, the process have been a product and they all trademark names. So that makes it even more difficult to grasp uh, the variety and how they're different. A prototyping process includes everything from the concept idea to the delivery of the prototype. The requirements are always ad hoc and it can be settled by agreement between the service provider and the customer. But if you look at an industrial manufacturing process, it consists of a series of sub processes and operations, and they all have defined interfaces and specific requirements. So we have a totally different need for consistency, predictability, traceability, and quality control. You need to have predetermined product requirements and verification throughout the industrial, industrial manufacturing process, which is not required exactly in prototyping. And then, of course, if you're a producer or a customer, there's a different process, purchasing process if you are buying a prototype than if you're buying an industrial product. Uh, in particular, if it's a subcontractor, there are different roles and responsibilities you need as a customer for an industrial product. You need to check different things than you would if it had been a prototype. And you also need to be very careful in how you communicate things. There are many, uh, uh, when we started out with additive manufacturing as rapid prototyping, there were many types of co different concepts, processes, and abbreviations. 
and they were quite often uh, developed and specified for specific processes, for uh, processes connected to specific companies. And it means that they were all thought they were unique and they had all their different language, all their different concepts. And it meant that it was not that easy to get a perfect exact understanding between different processes from our processes that could be similar, but from coming from different companies, different OEMs. So there were many different names and abbreviations. They included many registered trademarks, and there was also different and uh, similar processes it will be very confusing uh, and uh, to have any kind of clarity. We have, for example, names such as SLS, Select Laser Sintering, LS, Laser Sintering, DMLS, Dark Metal Laser and DMLM, SLM, Select Laser Melting, Laser Cusing, which are basically varieties of a very different names for a very similar type of process, the similar, same process architecture. Then we have names such as FDM, Fused Deposition Modeling, which is a trademarked. Then you have the name FFF, which is quite a funny because if you start with additive manufacturing before 2010, you think it means something. If you start with additive manufacturing after 2010, you think it's need fuse, fuse film and fabrication. But those earlier people like myself, we think it's free form fabrication and an earlier general term for additive manufacturing. And then there was uh, names such as laser cladding, dark light fabrication, uh, lens, lens laser engineered net shaping, DMT, direct uh, metal deposition, uh, light, uh, di light directed manufacturing, uh, uh, solid uh, direct manufacturing, uh, uh, construction laser additif direct, which was from a French company. EBSFF, electron beam solid free form fabrication, electron beam free form fabrication, or electron beam additive manufacturing. These are also names for similar processes, but different trademarks from different companies. Uh, what's quite sometimes uh, confusingly enough is called laser sintering. Uh, it was a process that was comes based on the first patent that was developed by Carl Decker at the University of Texas at Austin. He filed it in 86, it was granted in 89. And he made a trademark, select the laser sintering SLS. The problem is uh, Carl uh, was a brilliant guy in many ways and very nice guy too, by the way, but he was not an expert in material science. So when he called this sintering, it was because it was fusion of powders. The problem is that in powder metallurgy and ceramics, sintering is the term that's used when you are fusing powders which do not melt. But in this process with laser, they actually do melt. So it became a very difficult when metallurgists should accept this name because they say you say it was sintering, but it's actually by definition not sintering. Uh, so they had to change the name for that. Then uh, he, Deckard, uh, uh, also made a prototyping system, SLS, trade, uh, trademarked a prototyping system called, they also called SLS, so like laser sintering. Then another German company started to make similar machines. They called it laser sintering. And then they started to do it with metal. They called, started to call it direct metal laser sintering. And then they started to use to actually uh, they did not uh, started to actually melt the powders. They had to change it to their metal laser melting, uh, still in the same machine. Then another company called uh, Foklund Schwarz Stereolithography Technique. Uh, they trademarked the name SLM, Select Laser Melting, and they also still own it. And then a third company, also the same type of process, started to call it laser fusing, concept laser fusing, which was their own name. So, and these are also quite similar processes, but uh, with uh, just different names. Uh, three dimensional printing, even worse, three printing. It started out as a patent that, came, that which was actually named three dimensional printer techniques. Uh, came in from MIT, from C. Michael, uh, C. Manuel Sachs, John Haggerty. Uh, it was filed in 89, granted in, in 1993. They trademarked 3D printing. 
uh, and it was used for that for many years. And it then was licensed to some companies, uh, but it's not, uh, but it, uh, who also of course uses the name. But the problem is that this is not the technology that many people call 3D printing today. It's quite a different process and there's still a trademark for this process. So this is also a case of confusion. I'll get to that later. Uh, when it calls come into material extrusion processes, uh, it was also became also was developed a patent from uh, 1992. Uh, it was granted service trademark, fused deposition modeling, rapid prototype and process trademark, FDM. But then the patent for the actual process. Uh, became uh, get, get got out of date, so it became open. And a group of researchers at the University of Bath in United Kingdom started to make a cheaper machine, uh, a cheaper, more available machine built on the same principle. And that sent, but so and they developed the so-called RepRap machine. But since they could not use the name for the process FDM because it was trademarked and owned by Stratasys, they need to find out, figure out a new name. So they decided to fuse film and fabrication, FFF. The problem was by that time, FFF was already established as an acronym for freeform fabrication and used in some part of the industry as a general term for the whole area of additive manufacturing. And another thing that was, there was a, yet another company who used a very different technology had already trademarked FFF as a general term for their technology. So that's another case of mess and confusion. <clears throat> then uh, there were several processes that were based on, largely based on types of welding. But, but if you use it to make a coating uh, with a laser, they call it laser cladding. Uh, and there were several ideas and similar solutions and lots of patent, uh, but they were not necessarily the same. They were, uh, they were a bit different and they have many different names and many suggestions for process names, both a general and trademarked. They were called direct life fabrication, lay deposition manufacturing, shape deposition manufacturing. Uh, there were trademarks such as lens, laser engineered shaping, DMD, direct metal deposition, and clad, construction, laser addition. And then some person came up first with a general name and then ended up with a trademark. So this is another thing that's also a lot of confusion when you go into uh, trying to make an industry out of this. And it's again, in getting another issue is that when people are, have been used and learned something at one time, they, it's very difficult to, for them to learn something new. So there's still many people who are thinking in, of additive manufacturing in concept of rapid prototyping. So the difficulty is actually not really in uh, having accepting the new ideas, but actually escaping for the old ones. They, if you learn something much more difficult to unlearn it than to, it was to learn to begin with. AM is very cross-disciplinary and share many common traits with many different technologies. And people with different backgrounds tend to prefer whatever term they have learned first. So polymer professionals like to think additive manufacturing is a polymer forming process. Welding, think of it, this is just applied welding. Powder metallurgy, yes, this is powder metallurgy. We should use our concepts and our ideas. Computer science and data modeling, they say, okay, this is enabled by data. So it's, they, it's our concept that goes. People looking product modeling and uh, numerical control CNC milling, they say, okay, this is just an application. This is numerically controlled, so it should follow our models. And then uh, people who are starting with any application of AEM prefer the convention in that application area. So there's a great challenge. If you want to make an industry out of this, you need to develop some clear and consistent coherent terminology that goes for the whole area of additive manufacturing. That's one of the great challenges. And that's also why we needed to, to start to develop standards. The original role of standards, easily said, uh, very lightly, you could say a standard is a specification of best practices as agreed by consensus among experts. And they're very important. They're used for specifying requirements. If you want to specify requirements, you need to use the same type of communications. 
you need to have good communications. We have, as I mentioned before, many different names for additive manufacturing, never different acronyms. All of these, RP, RTR, M, FFF, LFF, LF, uh, SFF, ALM, ALF, AF, DDF, DDM, and 3DP, uh, all in the full names, have all been used as general terms for the whole area of additive manufacturing. And there are more actually of those. And if you want to document the best practices and do qualification of processes and products, you need to have some kind of standard on how to do this. You need to define the test methods and the protocols. There are many standards for that. You need to certi certification bodies need to reference the standards so that everybody would use those standards when they go into certification. And you need to be able to document the technical data and do it in the same way so everybody reads it, can understand it in the same way. And all of this will enable acceleration of adoption of new uh, technologies. Standardization additive in additive manufacturing started in with ASTM F42 in 2009. And one of the, the absolute very first challenge was what are we gonna call this technology? And they made a final coining and definition that it would be called additive manufacturing since, since this technology is based on successive addition of material. Uh, the scope is promotion of knowledge, stimulation of research, implementation of technology through the development of standards for additive manufacturing technologies. Membership in F42 is based on representation of different stakeholders. If you're employed by a company, you represent them. And if you're employed by a university or a university department, you can represent them with one vote. Or if you're a research organization, you can represent them with one vote. Quick facts. Uh, the current membership is over one. Uh, it's formed in 2009. Current membership is more than 1,000 uh, members, over 300 from outside the US. More than 35 countries participate. And there are more than 30 standards approved and more than 45 in development. There are uh, several subcommittees. Uh, we have uh, uh, test methods, design, uh, material processes. Uh, environmental health and safety, applications, terminology, and the US tags is the representation of U the United States into ISO, TC261, and there's also data. In uh, 2011, uh, TC, uh, ISO TC261 was formed uh, at an initiative for Dean. They had, they, German had already and during the 90s developed some guidelines for what they called rapid technologies and uh, proposed those as basis for new standards in additive manufacturing. Uh, since this was after uh, ASTM had started, many of the members who joined at that time were already members of ASTM. And uh, we were made it quite clear that we did not want to duplicate our work and we absolutely did not want to have contradictory standards. So we insisted that standardization should be aligned and coherent between uh, ASTM and ISO. Membership in ISO is based on the representation of the different natural standardization organization. Each member organization can nominate experts for different work groups, uh, one for each national standardization organization, one vote for each national standardization organization. So it covers a large part of the world. I see that Peru, unfortunately, has not joined yet, but I would certainly be welcome. Or if you prefer to work with the additive manufacturing standardization through ASTM, that's equally welcome. Uh, since the members of the ISA group also were, many of them were also members of ASTM, uh, they, we insisted that it, it's not a good idea to have competing standards. So ISO and ASTM have signed a unique uh, partnership standards development uh, organization agreement, uh, PSDO. Uh, it means that you can fast track the adoption of uh, the adoption process for ASTM standards and ISO standard to ISO standards uh, to actually promote an I uh, propose an ASTM standard as a final draft for an ISO standard. You can adopt ISO standards as ASTM standards. Uh, joint uh, maintenance of published standards and also joint uh, publication and copyrights and all the commercial agreements. This means that 
A, that uh, ISO and ASTM standards are joint and they are recognized in both organizations. Moreover, uh, TC261 has an agreement with the European uh, Standardization Committee, the CEN TC438, that converts all ISO ASTM standards also become European standards, meaning that they are mandatory in all of Euro, all European countries. So they are uh, E and ISO ASTM standards, which is given very heavy recognition and heavy weight. The idea of this collaboration is that we want a one set of AM standards to be used all over the world, which should be one market, one standards, should be fair and equal for all. It means that, but it means that we need to have consensus of the members of both organizations, which is a bit of the challenge. Uh, ISO ASTM standards are also validated by CEN to become accepted European standards. We build on the common roadmap and organizational structure for AM standards. Uh, we should, as much as possible, use the existing standards, but adapt them for AM when needed. Uh, the great emphasis, uh, if we should make a standard, we try to make it joint between ISO and ASTM together, because it's a clear requirement that we need to have a common, uh, coherent, consistent use of terms and definitions. Every term needs to mean the same in both organizations and all standards. We can't have a situation where terms mean different things, or we have different terms meaning the same thing. And there is this ISO ASTM 52900, and it's available. All terms and definitions are available for free, free of charge uh, through the ISO online browsing platform uh, with a link down here. Uh, there is a common structure, use general uh, AM standards uh, that are uh, applicable for all over the field. And then we have a little bit more specified standard looking to feedstock. Some look for process equipment, I'll look for finished parts. And then go from, if you have feedstock, uh, you're also going to material specific feedstocks and then application specific feedstock or process equipment, your process material specific equipment or application process specific, uh, specific uh, equipment or finished parts material specific parts and application material specific parts, all in to make this structure so there would not be too much overlaps and avoiding contradictions as far as possible. To get this working, you need to have a structure, fundamental structure. And most important to start with it was the name, figure out the name, that was ASTM start work out. And then how to define uh, what is the AM process? When does it start, when does it end? in difference from, for example, rapid prototype processes. And what is the AM-enabled production chain? So what's, how do you separate? And then they, they have the issue of, is AM what's going on just in the AM machine, or is it a little bit more? Does it go beyond that? So basically, that need to, we need to specify and make a definition of beginning and the end of the AM process. Then there are, of course, many different processes. As I mentioned, they're trademarks names. So we need to make some categorization to structure this. And then we need to, uh, this means we have to identify process categories and find common denominators based on process de architecture and then naming these process categories. To begin with the name of the AM, what is the least common denominator for AM technology? Well, in the definition for additive manufacturing that's been developed by ISO and ASTM, additive manufacturing is a process of joining materials to make parts from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing and formative manufacturing technologies. Uh, this actually gave you a lot of useful information. AM is enabled by the creation and communication of a 3D model data fail. This means that the 3D model is in practice a specification of the parts that are going to be made by the AM process. An AM process is characterized on how the material is added. The mechanism for delivering the feedstock material uh, is the process architecture. And that's a way how to distinguish different processes. Then we have, of course, the mechanism for joining the feedstock, but this is the subject to law to physics and chemistry. And through this definition, we can derive the beginning 
uh, of uh, of the AM process it says process of joint materials to make parts from 3D model data. So uh, the beginning is uh, specified by joint materials from 3D model data, and the end is specified by parts. It means that the AM process starts uh, by the 3D model file when it's ready to start when you when the machine starts to join the material based on the 3d model file and it ends when all the material needed to fulfill the specification of this model has been joined into a part so uh, what you call about post-processing is actually not really a part of the additive manufacturing process neither is design as such it's a design process it's necessary and require for additive manufacturing, but it's not additive manufacturing itself. Now, what is the part? Well, the part is by definition, the joint material forming a functional element that can constitute all or a section of the intended product. Uh, and this also means, this is important, the functional requirement for a part is typically determined by the intended application. So this means that if you intend to make a metallic product, you need to have established a metallic bonding in the part. Otherwise, it's not really a part finished. Same thing with ceramic. If you want to have make a ceramic part, you need to have ceramic bondings in it. And if you want to make a polymer part, you need to have some covalent bonds, some bonding that means. And actually, as mentioned before, the AM process builds the part material to into the shape of the product. So it's forming the joints, the material, which is a very crucial part of the AM process. Means that sometimes you can do it in one or several steps. Uh, a single cell process, you have the fusion of similar materials. You can do that with metallic, with polymers, with ceramic materials. But in a multi-step AM process, that process includes both the adhesion of the similar materials, such as metallic or ceramic powders that are being kept together with a binder, and then the secondary processing, such as uh, sintering in the furnace with or without infiltration. And that can be a method to make that uh, to make a both metallic uh, or ceramic, also composite materials. Uh, so you need to understand that the AM process includes not only what's going on in the actual AM machine, but also in the auxiliary equipment that make that actually make brings the product to the basic material that you want to have in the end, in the end product. If you want a metallic material, you need to have metallic properties in the part. So you probably heard the term 3D printing. I may clarify this too. Actually, there are five meanings to the term 3D printing that's been around for some time. Uh, to the winning, it was just using a printer technology to print text and pictures on a three-dimensional substrate. It has nothing to do with, with, uh, with what many people think is 3D printing today. Then it was, of course, as I mentioned before, it's an AM process that's based on the original patent, three-dimensional printing techniques, MIT 1993. That is what in uh, modern day standard terminals called the binder jetting process. And then there could be an AM process based on a traditional printing operation, such as binder jetting, or for example, material jetting. When you have a, uh, have a material that's being such as a wax or a, a photoreactive polymer that's being jetted out to a printhead. Uh, so and that's all been called. And then since these type of processes were low cost and easy to use, people started to use uh, uh, low cost and easy to use name for all systems. Uh, sorry, people thought to call uh, all systems that were easy to use and low cost 3D printers as, as indifference to the industrial rapid prototyping systems. So there, there, there was a, for a time, there was people said that any, any AM machine that cost less than $5,000 US dollars would be in a 3D printer. Uh, that's not really a good idea. 
but it meant that there is this that people started to believe uh, that uh, that uh, well, I maybe I give you the background for this. Uh, that was the situation up until 2010. In 2010, a guy called Chris Anderson, who was the editor in chief for uh, Wired magazine, wrote a book called "Makers and the New Industrial Revolution," where he argued that people uh, that the development of products would develop uh, would evolve similar to uh, free and open software development. He said that uh, with shared models through the internet and availability of cheap, uh, easy access uh, machine tools, such as laser cutters, desktop milling machines, and 3D printers would enable people to locally build whatever product they want and then share the designs and thereby in, uh, allow for product development. But since this book was the was uh, was for me in many cases the first time they came in contact uh, of this technology in mass media, it um, it uh, brought them to think that all of the additive technologies were three D printing, and that 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 has led to this misconception. So that is why ma many people think that all additive technologies is the same as three D printing. So as of today, additive manufacturing has a clear definition, no other meaning uh, within the context of AM, and it's a very useful term for clear, unambiguous communication for engineers, researchers, and academics, and other AM professionals. 3D printing is the term preferred by just about everybody else. But for example, uh, I usually have this mentioned this, is how many people believe they have polytetrafluoroethylene in their homes? Most people don't. But most people recognize that they have Teflon at home. But it's the same, it's just a more correct name. Teflon is just a trademark name for polytetrafluoroethylene. ethylene. So this is just a matter of context and who we're talking to, which terms that should be used. But it means that terminology is very important. Uh, to quote the Apache chief Koshi, who said that you must speak straight so that your words may go as sunlight into our hearts. I have set up a number of principles for terms and definitions. Common terms, uh, which a qualified user of a document will already know, uh, should not be defined. Uh, terms should not be as general as possible as long as they are clear, concise, and, uh, and short. There should be no trademarks. Definition of a term should be possible to use as the replacement term in the text and not include any restriction or specification. If needed, this should be specified as a part of the standard terminology. For example, avoid trademarks. We have the term, the name, select a laser melting SLM. It was the name of original develop, of a process develop, originally developed by uh, Focklund Schwarze. They have registered a trademark. And this means that SLM means exactly what that company says it means. They can decide and put in whatever meaning into their regular trademark as they wish. So for example, uh, they could decide to call a machine call, uh, with an electron beam, as meaning one machine that doesn't use a laser, to call it SLM because it comes from their company, SLM Solutions. Or they could use something that wouldn't use a powder bed. Or they could use any other product. For example, uh, the Swedish car maker Volvo, original Volvo is a trademark for ball bearings. The term means I roll, but it does not necessarily mean that everything that rolls is a Volvo. And Volvo, eventually Volvo went on to make construction equipment. They went boat engines and aerospace engines. And they were still Volvo, but they didn't roll, but it was a trademark. So for example, we have terms name, trademark names such as SLM or DMLS, DMLM, which is owned by a different company or lace accusing. It's a little bit like comparing Mercedes Benz with Audi and BMW. Still very nice German machines, but they have, uh, but they are, and of course they have some differences, but they're basically German high-end personal cars. Many different processes, common traits, uh, different trademark names. 
we need to make categorization based on process architecture. There are seven process uh, categories identified. Uh, we have binder jetting, directed energy deposition, uh, material extrusion, material jetting, powder bed fusion, sheet lamination, vat vulcanization, and they have all been based on process architecture. Now I see I'm gone way over time. I'm sorry for this. Uh, if you would like to, I can continue. I have uh, still a number of slides I can speak to, uh, but if you need to ask any questions before you leave, I'm willing to do that too. Please decide. Hello, Plus. Yeah, we have decided that we will continue with the presentation for the uh, slides that are still left. Uh, we will share the presentation with the attendees later, and also we will share the recording of the presentation so they can know what came after. So okay. I already shared the satisfaction form also in the chat, and they can <laughs> fill it up. And yeah. I know one thing they will they will say I'm talking too much and it's too long. <laughs> but I know that. Thank you. It's it's not a problem. It's a bad habit I have. No, oh, yeah. We decided to to continue. So uh, yeah, go Thank ahead. you very much. No worries. Uh, for example, process categories, binder jetting and material jetting. In binder jetting, this is what was the original, the first uh, so-called 3D printing process. You have a powder feeding system and the powder is being spread out in a build chamber and you use an inkjet type printer which deposits a liquid bonding agent which binds together a layer of the material and glues it. And then the platform, uh, elevator and platform will lower it a little bit, spread a new layer, build a, uh, spread a new layer, uh, bonded together with do the next cross section and and so on and so on <clears throat> then if you look at for example material jetting you also base it on a uh, printhead but instead of a binder you actually deposit the material typical such as a wax or a photopolymer resin uh, a material extrusion process the ones that people can buy quite cheaply and available and quite often mistakenly called 3D printers. Uh, you have a filament uh, fed from a coil or sometimes filament, uh, the feedstock could be uh, some uh, pellets, plastic pellets, it's fed up through a heat and extrusion nozzle, for example, uh, and deposited out in layers, uh, support structures added. As a low, the platform that's being lowered successfully, uh, or uh, you can have a directed energy deposition process where you have a such as a laser or an electron beam, or sometimes plasma, uh, where the which melts either powder or a wire brought together, and you can have a very mobile table below. Uh, that is the, this one's uh, we call it directed energy deposition because the energy source and deposition level uh, deposition direction can be uh, controlled or actually altered changed during the process. You can have you can actually turn the table, for example, building table and building a different direction if you wish to. And then we have powder bed fusion processes. Uh, also, you spread out the layer of powder, which is being fused either by laser or, for example, by an electron beam. Uh, if you do metals, you need to have a support structure that keep it anchored. If you have polymers, you usually don't need that because you don't have the same kind of shrinkage. Uh, the most known, the most commonly used industrial processes uh, could be mentioned also. Then we have sheet lamination, another type of process architecture where you have material, for example, from a roll being spread out. And there is some cutting device that cut a cross section of the part you wish before you add the next level of the material and you lower the platform in between. That photopolymerization processes means that you have a vat or tank of a photoreactive polymer. Uh, and there is, it could be a laser or actually an ultraviolet lamp. 
the laser will scan the surface of the uh, cross section you wish to have while the ultraviolet lamp uh, light shines through a photo mask that's been developed. And in both cases, it uh, solidifies, cures the polymer, and it's being, uh, and it's being successfully uh, raised in this way. New process categories, sure, uh, we can introduce new process categories. We have these seven based or uh, defined already. Uh, no problem to add a new one, but they have to have a very different process architecture from these ones. And, uh, and it should not be able to identify it as, for example, fusion of powder in a powder bed. Uh, it needs to be available on the market with proven staying power. We do not develop standards for research projects. It's a bad idea. Uh, to begin with, it would interfere the innovation potential when something is developing. And then you would develop a standard that is maybe not needed any, at all. And you need to have a developed market. Uh, it means to have a number of uh, providers of services, of equipment, and also a number of customers, users, and consumers. Actually, ASTM has a requirement for each uh, subcommittee that it needs to have a good balance, a specific balance between uh, producers, users, uh, consumers, and general interest. What you see to the right, there is actually a process I was working together with my colleagues on many years ago, when it still hasn't reached any commercial uh, application or has not been commercialized. It was based on deposition of layers by serographic methods. Uh, However, process categories are not that specific, not that detailed. So we have developed a system to make a higher, uh, a higher level of resolution in the uh, in the process identifications. It means that you can identify the individual process by process category, uh, the distinctive process characteristics, and the material processes. We use this system based, based on the to specific uh, procedure. We're starting by specify the process category, like binder jetting, BJT, uh, direct gen deposition, DED, uh, material extrusion, MEX, material jetting, uh, MJT, uh, powder bed fusion, PBF, sheet lamination, SHL, and that photopolymerization, BPP. The distinctive process characteristic is marked by a uh, minus, uh, and the material is marked by a slash. Typically, if you have a, have, have a in general material, the metal is marked M for for uh, metals, polymer for P, ceramic for C, and composite uh, CP, followed by the specific, specific material if you need it. Uh, multiple materials separated by commas. For example. If you have powder bit fusion of titanium TA64 aluminum uh, vanadium uh, is used in electron B would be PBF EB M TI64 or PBF EB TI64. Uh, powder bit fusion of cobalt chrome using a uh, laser-based system, PBF LB M COCR or PBF LB COCR. Uh, powder bit fusion of glass filled polyamide 12, PA12, PBF LBP, PA12GF. Well, it may not sound so good when you say it, but it has a very good advantage, a very high density and condensation of the, uh, of the description to get a very high resolution of the process this way. Uh, binder jetting of stainless steel uh, with subsequent sintering and bronze infiltration. It's a multi-step process since you, because you need to have this furnace process afterwards, which is MST, metallic material, M, stainless steel, STS, bronze infiltration, BI. So BJT, MST, STS, BI. More examples, if you have material extrusion of ABS plastic from heated nozzles, very common in those home and hobby machines that many people have, many people in schools have. 
you have bonding is by a thermal reaction. You have polymer material uh, and EBS plastic. So you could call it mixed TRBP ABS or mixed TRB AB ABS. Similar processes, mixed TRB P PLA or mixed TRB PLA, mixed TRB pellets PC. If you use pellets instead of the filament, for example. Questions? You're in shock if you're still here. Yeah, there are still some remaining here. <laughs> uh, but uh, okay. I have. I see that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I have a couple of questions uh, in private chat regarding uh, like how common is it to see new technologies of AM coming to the market? New process categories? Uh, none. There's very uncommon. It's common that company who want to launch their new machine say that this is a revolutionary process. It's entirely new. Uh, uh, we want a new process category and you, you should develop standards for us. Usually so far, when we check them out, we come to the conclusions that they are actually in many cases, just a new variety of any of the seven process categories. We have a one discussion point, which is cold spray, uh, where you have accelerate powder particles at a very high speed and simply let them fuse with a metal uh, with a metal substrate by impact. Uh, but people say that this is actually very similar to both material jetting and directed energy position. It's a directed kinetic energy or it's a jetting of material. So we have not really decided on it, but we are inclined we have to tend to say that it's probably one of those processes otherwise there have been no other new process since we specified the process categories back in 2000 and uh, i think it was in the summer 2011 or 12. thank you for the answer class and also uh one more question that i have here is what is the current uh challenge in if there's any in developing new materials for you, could all materials be adapted <laughs> oh, to this new technology? Absolutely, that it's enormous challenging. I will come to that later. Uh, many times, uh, materials have been developed to be adapted to existing uh, manufacturing processes, and if existing alloys for casting are have been optimized for casting properties. Uh, alloys for machining usually are developed to be all, to very, very good machining properties. But for additive manufacturing, they are not, uh, they may not perform as well. So you, many times you need to adapt these to get, by. you can, you could adapt these to make them more different. But there are so many process parameters to, get, to consider. I will show you that later. And uh, so I would argue that it's easy to join materials, that's not a problem, but make a good material, to make a good product, good material, that can be enormously challenging, but also very rewarding. I can assure those of you who decide to go into additive manufacturing and work with materials development, that you will not see the end of it, of that work. You will hardly see the end of the beginning of that work within your lifetime. Maybe you see, uh, you, you will see a little bit how it grows. This is something that will, people will be working, research will be working on for the next hundred years. Thank you, Flesk. And I have one last question, please, so far uh, about, you mentioned and it seemed that terminology is one of the complex parts in a standardization yes. process for AM. What yes. is another, what is the next, <laughs> what is the next one? What is the next complex? Uh, part in the standardization process in I, I say everything. That there, the, the thing is, you always need to have consensus. And it's very important, for example, in the ASTM process that everybody who votes must agree, or at least not disagree, not vote negative. So there are 
uh, many issues that people have different sense. So reaching consensus is a challenge. And terminology uh, will always keep on developing because there will be always new terms and new aspects and new applications. Uh, I know I can probably continue that for the next of my life, the rest of my life, if I, uh, 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 if they will have me. Uh, but then there will always be new standards and new challenges. And looking further, uh, additive manufacturing, since it's based on the communication of 3D model files, is very much as a key stepping stone to digital manufacturing. And that means it has to be coordinated and work together with numerous other type of technologies in an entirely digitalized manufacturing situation. And that is where the developing is. So I would say that a great challenge that coming ahead will be to uh, be able to coordinate and ensure uh, some kind of coherency of standards within different technologies and different technology traditions but they need to be working together in a digital manufacturing system. And that will be a huge challenge in many years to come. All right, thank you, Klaus, for that answer. Uh, those are the questions I have so far. So I think okay. we can continue. We have a, we'll, we'll have more opportunities to, uh, further down the line. Uh, as additive manufacturing is being industrialized, we need to understand that additive manufacturing is much more than just technology. We talk about the complete new paradigm for manufacturing. We have different manufacturing principles change the rules for, manu uh, for useful game for production and design. You can make new geometries, you get new materials, new material properties, or actually different properties out from the old materials. You will develop different production chains because additive manufacturing will influence the entire production chain if you put it in. And means you have a lot of flexibility, you have a lot of variability, but you need to think differently. You need to think different when you design, you need to think different when you look at material because it's being influenced, it's actually being formed during the process, it means it can be manipulated during the process. It can also, but you also need to control the parameters in the process to be able to get the material properties you're looking for. And this has huge impact on product development. Then, since this is handled through uh, in the digital files, the question is, who are the in, have the intellectual property rights? Uh, is the original designer or the person who, or the company who actually used it? If you are exporting a digital file for a design, which is quite possible, and someone build it in some other part of the world, who owns that right to that design then? and who is responsible for the performance if something goes wrong with it. And then where is the value in the creation and process and services? Is it the value so much in the design or is it actually in being able to create or produce a product with the right properties based on that design? Maybe is that another part of the value creation? And how do you separate the value creation between the different uh, the different units. If someone has this, if someone had designed, someone in Norway had designed a, uh, a a good design, and then someone in Peru, for example, will build it to have fantastic properties, who would have the right uh, to own uh, and have the responsibility for that product? If it's let's say then it's used in in China. Who is responsible for it and who should have the benefit, who should make money on it? Is it the designer, the person who built it, or who? This is something we need to sort out. These are issues, difficult challenges that people need to think about. So there's a lot of thinking to do where sort of rethinking. With additive manufacturing, processes and materials are more coupled than in any of the conventional processes. There's lots of variables and parameters. There are different machine systems. We have different system setups. We have different calibrations for each machines. We have different conditions and produce different results. For example, if you build uh, with one type of machine in, uh, it, in a certain temperatures and humidity, it can pro uh, process, uh, the material can be processed differently if there's other temperature and humidity in the rooms that the machine stands in a different country. You need to have control that in some way. 
how can you ensure that you can fulfill the product requirement? You need to have a very good process specifications. You need to have predictability and stability and traceability in the process every time you're building, particularly if it's if it's industrial manufacturing, because then you need to be very sure about the properties in your final product, wherever you built it, whichever machines you've done it with. So there's, a, there's some challenges in quality management. You need to be able to develop a system for traceability, for inspection and verification of the product, and you need to have documentation. Certification and qualification requires testing and evaluation, and you also need specified conditions. Design, for example, we have great possibilities, but there's a lots of constraints that people don't necessarily think about. Uh, we have topology optimization. Uh, it's a great possibility. Uh, it means that you have something, they actually do calculate what design you should have uh, for quite nice organic forms. Uh, but you also need to think how that would process in the machine. And if you need to remove it from the machine, if do you have any uh, different tensions built up during the building process? Do you have uh, uh, inhomogeneous properties because you built it in layer play? Did you use the same type of machine or the same material as it was intended? So you need to, when you design for AM, you need to design not only for AM, but you need to, you need to consider the entire manufacturing process chain. And then you need to see the cost for production. How much material is used? AM process time, and uh, which uh, depends a little bit on how you orient the part and how you designed it. And also the need for post-processing. You can maybe make a design that's very good for AM, but then you need to do the post-processing. If that's difficult, then it, that will raise the price and the cost and the uncertainty in that part. You need to think about the production speed, uh, the orientation, risk for an, an, iso, an isotropic. There could be tensions in the, in the product. And there is, for many types of projects, uh, products such as when you make uh, metal parts in part of it fusion, you need you have a lot of supports. You need to consider how to remove them, and then you have the issue with the post-processing operation. There's heat treatments. There's clamping during the post-processing, or if you need to machine, how you how can you clamp a very complex geometry if you have a, we need to mill some critical surfaces? Uh, how do you inspect it, and how do you verify it? All these things you need to be considering when you do design for AM. So it's very important that, this, that the design is directly involved with AM process to actually get to understand not only what you can do, but what you need to be considering during the, when you design something for AM. You need to build experience. And it takes about, many times I found in my own experience that if you talk about an experienced designer uh, who's used to design for conventional manufacturing process, it takes about six months for them to start to be able to start to think and inspire a new thinking of AM. So this is something that, uh, this is actually something many industries are struggling with. They heard about AM, they like the idea, but they don't really know how to use it. Then this is the thing about material parameters, getting back to the earlier question here. The development of AM process parameters for a new alloy if it's a new alloy, but the same uh, metal system that is used, it takes about six to 24 months if you have a very experienced uh, engineer working on it and good access to materials lab. It doesn't make any sense to just order a part in your, the alloy you would normally use if you'd used conventional manufacturing. Uh, it's better to choose an alloy that's already developed for AM or invest in the uh, in the in developing the new process parameters for the, for your uh, preferred material, and the cost of developing a process for new alloy, just a new alloy in, of a known uh, type of material, is about two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. You can be lucky, but you can also be unlucky. You don't know that to begin with. Just because you can build something with AM in a material doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea think what what are the benefits and why should I use this material? Could you use some other, for example? Sometimes as in the bracket I showed you, the one from Airbus, uh, the topology optimized bracket, uh, they realized it was much better deal 
to build it in titanium than to do it in aluminum, even if aluminum was available, but it didn't save that much by using aluminum. And they could save a lot more weight because they used thinner sections if they built it in titanium. Uh, AM processing uh, of an alloy optimized for conventional manufacturing will not have the same material process if you do it by AM. So the question is, do you really want that alloy or is it perhaps a specific combination of properties? And then you need to ask yourself, which are the properties you actually need for these applications? And, uh, and uh, you don't, for example, want need it to be very good to be milled, mill, milling properties and to be easy to make a lot of chips from. You don't necessarily need it to be, have very good costing properties. But what are the properties you need in the products? An AM doesn't necessarily produce a finished part in one operation. You need to, dependent on the application, you need to think of different post processing. There will be need for heat treatment for many metals. You need, you may need machining on critical surfaces. And you need to be able to design and consider this uh, also when you look at the materials. Uh, this is actually an overlook by a, a federal aviation authority in the United States of all the type of parameters that influence the part quality in the powder bed fusion process. Uh, this is, uh, I, I would say, it, they have said it's well over 200 parameters to be considered. So don't think this is easy necessarily, but you can do a lot of things. But it's easy to get to make something. It's, that's that's not a problem. But make something really, really good that you have full control of. That is a bit of a challenge. But we need to develop, of course, uh, predictable material properties, and it depends on which normally depends on the process parameters you have. But be able to, be able to design for these properties, there is something called the MMPDS handbook. Metallic Material Properties Development and Standardization, which is uh, a source for statistically based design values for commonly used me metallic materials and joints. Uh, it's recognized for certification purposes by the FAA. It's also by different departments of agencies, such as the American Department of Defense and NASA. Uh, the current edition was made uh, published in 2017. The next edition they're working on will include AM materials. But then they need to also, but then they need and rely on standards uh, to determine the statistically based design values. Uh, the rules for this need to be uh, determined dependent on standards. So that's something that's under development right now. Then thinking about the market, the AM market is not necessarily very mature. Industries does not necessarily know on how to do it. The characteristics of a well-functional market is that there are many small buyers and sellers. Uh, buyers and sellers have equal access to information. Products are comparable. And a, a quote from Alfred Marshall in his well-known principles of economics, the more nearly perfect the market is, the stronger is the tendency for the same price to be paid for the same thing at the same time in all parts of the market. So I thought I'd make an observation and check the reality here. First ask, which market are we talking about? Say the market for AM. Is it the whole production capability? But then sometimes AM is used for prototyping. Sometimes it's used for end use parts. Those are very different developed. Prototyping in AM is very established. That's not a difficulty, but that's all based on uh, an agreement between the, uh, between the producer and the customer. The end use markets, manufacturing markets is quite different. Then you need a different levels and then there's a different level of agreement and predictability uh, and uh, process control. And that's uh, not quite as developed. Then you need to think, think about markets in terms of application areas. We have in aerospace where they're quite used to buy things from AM, medical too. But for machine, machine tools and automotive, they have not really reached that, that level yet. Uh, 
And then we have markets for specific products. Uh, shall we compare AM as conventional produced as they are in competition in reality? So the market is not quite developed. Many small buyers and sellers, is it? Well, this is an observation from Germany. Uh, it's not quite true. In some parts of Germany and Austria, like in Bavaria, for example, there are there it's uh, almost uh, 40 or 50 producers of services uh, within Bavaria. Uh, but then if you look into other parts, you can see that the, the more pale the color is, the fewer are the producers. So there are not that many who offer these services, at least not in Germany. And Germany is still considered one of the more developed countries in the world when it comes to AM. So this is something that needs to be developed. We need more users. We need more suppliers. We may need more industrial application of AM to be able to develop a good market. Buyers and sellers have equal access to information. Well, uh, do buyers really fully understand the AM enabled process chain? In my experience, not. Absolutely not. Uh, actually, I think sometimes it's quite difficult to see if people in university do, uh, uh, you mean university professors fully understand uh, the whole aspect of the AM production chain. Uh, do, can a buyer be sure that the, pro, that the part produced with a complex process chain fulfilled expectation and requirements? Well, they need to have a test to verify that, and you need to have standards that specif the specify how to do these tests and also standards specify how to do this process. And those are something that are under development. It's not quite finished for all processes yet. And that is why AM need to develop more transparency in the process chain and specification of requirements in all process steps. Documentation. You need to have documentation and verification of the parts compliance to requirements. And that is something that develops uh, case by case basis dependent on the industry's interests. So we need some work here. Products are comparable. Well, it depends on the market requirements, of course. Uh, there are different requirements, different properties. Uh, there are different geometries that are needed. And there is, of course, variability depending on the AM process. Do we have the same calibration of similar machines? Will we have the same results? All of this needs to be standardized and controlled by standards. And there's a lot of things to be done there. So they need specifications and definitions for all parts of this. The more nearly perfect market is, the stronger the tendency for the same price to be the same thing at the same time. Also from Germany. Uh, AM Power Insights as a consultancy business looked into this and they checked for a service. Uh, the same service for AM could vary between from being 30% to 230% of the mean price offered. Same service. So the market hasn't really uh, been perfected yet. So, <clears throat> so very important, big challenges in the AM industry is building the intellectual infrastructure for AM in industry and society. We need to build the knowledge, the users, the potential customers. And you as students have a very important role here. You need to learn AM and you need to spread the knowledge of AM, that you learn about AM to uh, the market, to your employers, to your customers and to your colleagues. Think about what should we do by AM? Why should we do by AM? How should it be do by AM? We need a structure. We need legislation, how to handle the IPR in issues. Who has the responsibilities of AM production and digital production as a whole? What are the regulations? How are the trade regulations? How can we discuss, how can we handle export if, for example, we have exported the use of a digital file? Are there any duties on that? How do we handle this? How do you do with certification? Uh, uh, how do you do with certification? How can we ensure it? Standardization, we need to continue develop uh, coherent standards and coordinate standards throughout the world because this is a world market, it's a global market. Uh, there are certain organizations that develop certification guides for metallic AM. We have Lloyd's Register. 
they developed a collaboration with TWA, the, the Welding Institute in the United Kingdom, have, been, have developed a AM part certification service for all industries as they sell it, for marine and uh, and uh, and uh, for marine and to oil and gas and the classification of oil and gas and upstream and downstream. The services include uh, independent assurance of additive manufacturing feedstock, assurance of uh, production facilities, certification of parts. They have made parts according to this and they have this guideline outside out there. Uh, there is a DNV, Norwegian based classification society has developed a new classification guide for approval of AM parts also approval of manufacturers and a type approval for feedstock. It provides uh, support for AM manufacturing and uh, aim to qualify the premises for technology, uh, offers approvals of certification uh, uh, surfaces according to agreed performance specifications. So this is available and they keep on developing. Uh, EWF, European Federation for Welding, Cutting and Joining, well, it's not only European, it's actually recognized in large parts of the world. Uh, they have a, developed a, a qualification program for process operators, and they are also chairing the development, the joint development for qualification requirements for operators and engineers for AM within ISO and ACM. So the, this system will be very much uh, aligned with uh, what EWF already has. Uh, they have developed uh, professional profiles for uh, power to bed fusion operators, direct energy position operators, direct energy position laser beam operators, uh, power to bed fusion uh, engineers, direct energy position engineers, and power to bed fusion designers, uh, uh, direct energy position designers, they're doing for metal AM coordinators and supervisors. So there's actually a whole group of specialists, uh, spe specialist uh, professionals that need to have qualifications, need to be qualified to be able to do this. So there's a huge work here done here. Other organizations have developed training program for industrial AM. They have two suit in Germany, uh, offered a role by training certification for quality managers, engineers, business strategists, machine operators, they also offer services on uh, industrial uh, production site certification, uh, where they assure reproducibility, simpler and faster global scaling, uh, ensuring compliance to the latest AIM standards, and make sure that they're an independent third party to support implementation of best practice methods. Now, getting into standardization. Oh, do you have any questions of that part so far, or shall we go directly to the standardization specification here? No, uh, getting close. I, don't, I don't have any, any more questions so far. Okay. Uh, we get into standardization. It's not that far any longer here. Basics to standardization. All standards development is based on contribution from members, voluntary contribution from members. You do not get any compensation for the work you do in standardization, at least not anything in terms of money. So the members and stakeholders must base the contribution on their interest in developing new standards and the commitment to this. Uh, there's no funding or compensation from the SDOs and the SDOs have all the IPR. So I need to be a bit careful what I tell you about the standards I participate in development. It's all consensus basis, it needs to be agreement about them. In ASTM, uh, experts are nominated directly by the stakeholders, which could be a company, university or professional organization. The type of membership depend on the nature of the stakeholders interest. If it's a machine builder, then you're a producer. If you are using a service provider, then you are a user of the process or if you're just an end user of the parts or products, then you're a different type of, uh, type of membership. ISO and SEN, experts are nominated from the national committees. Uh, it's the, uh, the national committee, you're a member of the national committee and then they say, okay, you're an expert in this field, you need to develop standards on that on the national level. When you start to do in standardization, if you have an idea for a standard like to have developed, you need to make a new work item proposal. In ASTM, it means that you submit it to the subcommittee. 
which would then be uh, one of the F42 point something committees. And uh, the, the, if they decide that this is something that's interesting, we'd like to develop, they request for participation. If there are enough people who want to participate, then they can start to work on it uh, and develop standards. And it requires that a minimum of 60% of committee members participate in the ballots. Otherwise, the, uh, the project is terminated. In ISO, you submit it to the, to the secretariat of the ISO committee, and they circulate it, and there is a ballot if this is something that needs to be developed, uh, this is standard needs to be developed. And if it passes the ballot, there will be a call for expert and the national mirror committees to the te international technical committee where it may nominate experts. And the work group secretariat is normally appointed to whoever submitted the proposal. And drafts are circulated at a regular basis between the member groups to make sure uh, that to be able to, that they can comment and provide input. Then we have the joint ISO ASTM AM groups. That means that each ISO and ASTM can propose an item and invite the other partner to join. Uh, you appoint typically three to five, but it could be more. Expert from each ASTO can uh, participate in, in the joint work group. And then they develop and it develops following the ISO template. Uh, and is being balloted in parallel. The drafts are reviewed by both organizations. There are parallel ISO and ASTM ballots. Uh, in ISO, there is a draft international standard, DIS ballot, takes three months to do this. And then FDIS uh, takes two months if it's needed. Uh, if people did not agree about the DIS ballot. Uh, for ISO, approval requires that 66.6, I mean two third are affirmative and no more than a quarter are negative. In ASTM, it's difficult. There's just one ballot and that's a 30 day balloting cycle. Uh, but uh, approval requires that 60% of the return ballots, but there can be no negatives. So there is one single individual who do not like that standard that can stop it until it has been resolved which can be a challenge in its own. On the other hand, if you make a change, it's easy to make a new ballot and a new ballot and a new ballot until you actually get it past everybody. Uh, editorial changes are allowed after each ballot. Uh, comments resulting from the ASDM ballot can be submitted to ISO balloting process and vice versa, but then you need to ballot again. <clears throat> ASDM F42 has subcommittees. Uh, it means the same as work group in ISO. Uh, there are uh, subcommittees for test methods, for design, for materials and processes. And then there are uh, sub subcommittees under that for metals, polymers, and ramics. There's e e environment, health, and safety subcommittee, and one for applications, one for data and terminology, which is my area. In, <coughs> in ISO, you have Work group for terminology, process systems and materials, test methods for qualifications, data and design, environmental health and safety. And then there are joint working groups with other uh, ISO committees, uh, for example, between TC261 and TC44, uh, for particular for aerospace applications. And there's one for uh, plastics between TC261 and TC61. And there is one for uh, surgical implants between TC uh, uh, 261 and TC 150. Um, this is to make sure that we have as much as wide uh, number, uh, as wide uh, num wide perspective of ne necessary expertise, and also that people should agree to join the same, to agree to use the same standards. But sometimes it can be very difficult to make every, all of these people from all these different backgrounds agree on the same standards. So that's that's a big work. The subcommittee for applications have been looking into uh, nine so far different application areas, looking at aviation, space flight, medical and biological applications, transportation, heavy machinery, maritime applications, electronics, construction applications, oil and gas applications, and consumer applications. 
And in between ISO and ASTM, there are joint groups. There are currently 27 actives and some inactive ones. They're total working on 28 different standards, working together on those. 15 of those are uh, joint ISO and ASTM standards have been published. Therefore, pure ISO standards have been published and 16 ASTM, pure ASTM F42 standards have been published. Well, since AM has become very popular and been come to great interest since 2015, there have been many new stakeholders, other standardization committees, international and national uh, organizations have been going into and uh, made intentions of making standards for additive manufacturing and started their own standardization. This is a bit of a challenge. In the United States, we see that ASM E07, ASM E08, and ASM EY 1446, uh, ASM EB46, uh, ASM EBPVC, uh, AS SAE AMS, uh, aerospace materials, and AWS. To some extent, this has been able to uh, coordinate it through an, uh, an, an, an American initiative uh, called. America makes. Uh, to some extent, AWS uh, have so far decided not to collaborate with ASTM and ISO, which is a pity. Uh, some of these have uh, realized that making AM standards is a lot more challenging than they first thought. Uh, so they decided that they needed to, uh, they, decide, they decided that they would not continue doing it and instead join ISO ASTM as members there. Uh, and, in some, and in some cases, there is some parallel work, but ISO and ASTM collaboration is the predominant producer of AM standards and at least the only one that make them coherent and consistent. In ISO, uh, there are have been interest from uh, a group that's looking on information technology. Uh, they call it 3D printing and scanning and try and have made some attempts to develop their own terminology in competition with ISO and ASTM, which is, in my opinion, very annoying. Then there are a couple of committees, uh, a couple of subcommittees on the TC184 who have been looking at uh, making standards for AEM if regarded as a, a CNC milling machine. Uh, this also brings uh, some challenges and there have been some issues in how to make these compatible with the ones that have been developed by TC261 ASTM F42. Uh, one, one would presume perhaps that the more people are working on the AM standard would uh, make things faster overall. But uh, the problem is if you can't coordinate it, you have a high risk of duplication of efforts and overlapping content. There's a high risk of inconsistencies, sometimes contradictions and conflicting standards, then there is ambiguity and confusion in the market. And with the diversity and complexity of AM, uh, this makes it, it's actually even more critical. And then there is not that, there are not that many experts in AM, actually real experts in AM in, the, in, in reality. So it could be spread thin. So maybe there are not as many that there will be needed in each committee. So people are Experts are uh, developing, few, too few experts developing on competing standards in different committees, which is also a waste of effort. <clears throat> so in concluding remarks, I'm sorry for being so much over time. Development of AM standards is a key element to establish AM as a part of the industrial manufacturing system. And, it's, uh, and it does provide an intellectual infrastructure to the market. There is an international collaboration between ASTM, ISO, and CEN in Europe. Uh, it's very well established and it's growing. They, they wor we work together to make one set of standards used all over the world. And this is unique. It's something that's very much, it's very great if we, uh, as long as we can, can make this work. We have a common roadmap and organization structure for AIM standards. We use existing standards, uh, but adapt them for AM if needed. We have work groups, and there are many standards that have been uh, published, uh, both by the individual organization, but also as a set of published, you know, uh, and also many that are joint. 
we're just we are just in the beginning of exploring the many possibilities of AIM technology. This I will not see the end of it in my lifetime, and I'm not, and I doubt that any of you will. I certainly wish you all a long and happy life, but I cannot guarantee that you will see the end of additive manufacturing development as long as you live. Uh, knowledge is critical. Everybody needs to learn. Everybody who is involved in this. If you have missed right expectations and uh, preconceptions, you will have lead to disappointments, and you will cause you know, there will be confusement and disagreement. No one will ever benefit from competing standards. So if you have any chance, please join into part of the ongoing effort through ASTM F42, ISO TC262, and your national organization. We can work together and make this get this right. We have not seen the tip of the iceberg yet, but we have surely entered a new university in manufacturing. And with this, I thank you for the attention, in particular for you very brave and very patient people who has been staying with us for so long time. Uh, it's been fun. It's been times and I had a lecture before, but I, it's very nice and I feel honored to be asked to do this for you guys. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, class, for presentation. Yeah, there are still some people here. I think it's also pretty complicated schedule for us and also for you, but we also appreciate yeah. that you had a time and dedication for doing this for us. Uh, I just have a couple questions registered, but if you, uh, the, attendees, the attendees have some questions, you can put it in the chat. I have one that says, uh, in your opinion, what is the most limiting factor in the growth of AM? And if you consider that all industries can adapt their processes to this new technology? I think the most limiting factor is the lack of knowledge. Uh, industries need to learn how to use this in the right way, in an efficient, uh, in an efficient and correct way. And th that needs to be learned individually in all the industries. An operator need to learn that. So there's a big challenge to ensure that you get good education in schools, in universities, good research, but also lifelong learning in the, for people who are professionals out, uh, uh, out in industry. Then we need, of course, everybody uh, around in, in the infrastructure, all the challenges when it comes to regulation and certifications. Uh, that is also need, need to be developed uh, and, uh, and uh, all of it, <laughs> basically, we have the, what you, what uh, I think I covered lots of it in this presentation. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Yeah, honestly, I, I also feel that uh, most of the questions were answered during the whole presentation. So. That's maybe why we just have a couple of them. Uh, one says, which do you think would be the most important AIM industry for South America? Uh, yeah. Or well, maybe if, if you have some knowledge about South American industry. <laughs> I'm not an expert in South American industry. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's up to you to, uh, you to determine that. Uh, you will need to, as, as all, all parts of the world, you need to find, see what are the, where can you use AM in a clever way? What industries do you have and how can they use it in a clever way? Uh, AM is so diverse. You will find many opportunities where you can use AM, even if it's just making a specialized, customized or repair a part from somebody, making spare parts for an old car, if you have an old car, or making uh, new optimized things for the next type of air, uh, next type of airplane you will be, be developing. I mean, South America is a diverse area with some very advanced industries and some some areas that still struggle with some poverty. Uh, you will find it. I think this the 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 best applications you will be developing those. I will not give you. I cannot give you those answers. Uh, the way that you could. That's true. 
I, I can think in some strong industries here as the mining yeah. one or the construction yeah. one. I'm pretty sure there and, are some uh, applications already in there. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there will be spare parts. There will be optimizations. Uh, there will be, for example, if you're talking about you have certainly uh, hydropower, maybe repairing all the, the turbines for hydropower could be an area. Uh, I hope that you, when you go out and work in industry, take as much knowledge as possible about AI with you and find these solutions. You're, you're, you are the future of South American engineering and industry. You will do it. I'm sure you will. Thank you, Klaus. And I have one last question. It says, uh, it actually asked about uh, the ASTM committees and about the requirements or previous studies that someone has to have in order to join the, any committee or the F42 committee. Well, it's an interesting question. Normally, you need to have you, you need to represent somebody, something. Uh, some people are actually joining just by themselves uh, as an independent. Some people and some members who are just retired and ha and have been joined as such. I wonder. I haven't checked it out, but I, it could perhaps be possible. I don't know if it is that ASTM allows members of the student chapter to join the committee. It's possible. I need to check that out. Uh, but otherwise, if you're a student and perhaps you could ask in the department where you're studying if you could be allowed to represent them in ASTM F42, sure, that would be fine. Membership costs about $75 for an individual member. That's what I pay. <laughs> right, yeah, the, the last time I checked it was also $75 for joining. Yeah. All right, uh, I have no more questions in the chat. Uh, I think uh, that would be all for all of us today. Uh, again, I want to thank you, class, for uh, your presentation, your commitment, and for helping us sharing this, well, important information that is not really well known so far in Latin America. And yeah, go yeah. ahead. That, that, then I just thought maybe you should go to your professors in your university and tell them that you want education in additive manufacturing. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the aims of this uh, yeah. small talk series. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. good. Yeah. Okay. So now I invite uh, all the attendees that are left to, if you haven't so far, uh, fill up the uh, satisfaction form, you can do it on the previous message. And also my partner will send uh, a series of links so you can follow us in social media so you can uh, be aware of the uh, coming events. And also you can find the YouTube link where you can find this uh, talk later on. And we will be sharing the PDF of the presentation. Uh, thank you for all, also that, for that class. That would be very helpful. Yeah. And well, I need a little. Uh, I will need a little time to uh, to adapt the presentations to right. uh, to hand up mode, and then we'll see if there is a way I can submit it. Because as you noticed, it's a bit large, so there could be so so it may not be some challenge, so, some issues, some challenges in uh, sending it as an email. Uh, but we'll work on that. We'll figure a way. All right. No worries with that. I'll uh, or the organizations will work in sending the presentation and the material to the to the attendees. So again, thank you one more time, and thank you. We hope to work for later in again in coming events. And well, thank you, thank you for your time, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for staying so long. And I'm sorry for. Uh, <laughs> dragging over the time, but well, if you're a nerd and you speak about your favorite topic, it's hard to stop. Yeah, it was worth it, so thank you for that. Well, uh, I'll be ending this session and and we wait for you in the 
the tomorrow topic, which is bioprinting. So uh, we'll send you a reminder of that. Again, thank you and see you then. Bye. Bye-bye.